One of the simplest quantum objects we can think of is the hydrogen atom. It is made of a proton and an electron. We will see what the semi-classical approximation of quantum mechanics predicts for this system. This approximation is based on classical trajectories for the particles. Here the proton has a positive electric charge and the electron has a negative electric charge. Laws of electrostatic tells us that these two particles attract each other uh, with a potential energy proportional to the product of the charge uh, divided by the distance between the particles. Here the particles are so light that the gravitational interaction is negligible compared to the electric electrostatic interaction. The proton mass is about 2000 times uh, the mass of the electron, so we don't expect the proton to move. Um, and the fact that the potential energy is in 1 over r and that the particles attract each other, we expect a similar classical trajectory than what we get in gravitational systems like a planet rotating around the sun or a satellite rotating uh, around the planets. So let's write the position of the electron in polar coordinates. The kinetic energy therefore can be written as and the Lagrangian just reads using the Euler Lagrange equations for the coordinate r we get If we consider for simplicity a circular orbit of the electron, then r dot dot is zero because there is uh, r is a constant. Because r is constant for a circular orbit, uh, r dot is zero and therefore the kinetic energy simply reads. Using the equation we just obtained, this gives, which we see is half the absolute value of the potential energy. This is what we call the virial theorem, um, which states that the kinetic energy of a particle in the potential in 1 over r and following a circular orbit is half the magnitude of the potential energy. Using these results, we can simplify the expression for the Lagrangian. So if we want to calculate the action for one orbit, and considering the fact that r is a constant, we simply get... If we come back to our earlier result, we see that uh, theta dot is a constant because r is a constant for circular orbits. And we have a full rotation of 2 pi over um, uh, a time capital T. Therefore, we get an expression for T which we can replace into our expression for the action. We now would like to compare this action with h-bar. For that we will take the radius of the hydrogen atom to be uh, about 5 times 10 minus 11 meter. And we will use um, typical units for atomic physics which are electron volt for energies and electron volt per c squared for masses. So we get an action which is about one order of magnitude larger than h-bar. Being larger than h-bar, this justifies uh, the use of the semi-classical approximation. However, it's not much larger than h-bar. Therefore, we should not go too far and use a classical model. Uh, so we should keep a quantum treatment for our problem. Now imagine we have an experimental setup which is able to measure if the electron is located at some point x at a distance r from the proton. The rotation of the electron around the proton is very very fast, so it is likely that during the finite time of the measurement, the electron will have made a large number n of turns. 
So the amplitude of probability to find the electron in X will be obtained by summing the amplitudes of probability to be in X after each rotation. This means we need to sum the phasor obtained for each number of rotations where j is the number of rotations and sj is the action for this number of rotations. Naturally, sj is just uh, j times the action for one rotation, s1, which we calculated earlier. So after each rotation, the phasor will usually point in a different direction. With many rotations, the sum of the phasors will quickly go to zero. However, in the particular case where S1 is equal to 2 pi h bar times an integer number, then we have uh, the phasor uh, equal to 1. And in this case, it doesn't matter how many rotations the, the electron does, uh, the phasor will always end up to be 1. In this case, all the phasors are pointing in the same direction and their sum is clearly non-zero. To conclude, the electrons can only be found in orbits with S1 equal 2 pi n and n h bar, as they are the only one with a non-zero amplitude of probability. Now, if we combine this expression for S1 with the one we got earlier for classical trajectory, we can easily show that the radius uh, for the trajectories, for the orbit of the electron, can only take some um, uh, well-defined discrete values. This means that we can only find the electron in orbits like that. Unfortunately, we can't measure directly the um, radius of the orbit of the electrons uh, which, in order to confirm our theory. Uh, however, we can uh, measure relatively easily the energy of this electron, and this energy will also be uh, um, taking discrete values uh, because n is an integer. So we, if we express the energy uh, for the electron on this uh, specific orbit, what we get is We see that the energy can only take discrete values, uh, or what we call energy quanta. Uh, that's what gave the name of uh, quantum mechanics. Now, of course, we only solved the problem approximately because we used the semi-classical approximation. It turns out that if we were solving the um, uh, problem for the hydrogen atom using exact quantum mechanics, we will get um, similar quantization for the radius and the energy. The only difference will be um, in the numerical factor. We also call these energies energy levels, and we know they exist and they are quantized because um, we can uh, make the electron move from one orbit to another by sending a photon onto the atom. When the electron absorbs a photon, it goes up into energy and it will change uh, its orbit. Um, in, in a similar way, the electron in a high orbit can go down to a lower orbit by emitting a photon. And of course, because the total energy is conserved, the photon is going to carry the difference of energy between the initial and final level of the electron. And guess what? This is exactly what is observed experimentally, as you can see on this figure. Now you understand why some objects have different colors than the others.